Last time uh, we began to look at how uh, really at the about the eighth and ninth and tenth centuries how uh, Europe entered into a, like a second phase of barbarian invasion and uh, Central and Western Europe were really kind of uh, under siege. We, and we talked about the culprits here. The, from the north, you had the Norsemen, or the Vikings, as they're better known as. Uh, also from the east, from the steppes of Asia, you had the, the Magyars, also known as the Hungarians. And then from the south, from the Mediterranean land, you had uh, Saracens, which was a European word to describe Muslims in general. It could be Arabs, it could be Moors from uh, Africa, from North Africa, and from mainly North Africa, mainly from places like uh, Algeria and, and Libya. Uh, uh, these Saracens were uh, targeting ships and uh, raiding the shores of France and Italy uh, in this time period. Now, as a reaction to that, what we see happening in Europe, in the, especially in the 10th century, 9th and 10th century, uh, as a reaction to that, you, you begin to see uh, Europe take shape. Uh, you know, you've heard the phrase crucible, which is a, used in blacksmithing, you know, when you, when you form an object, and some people have referred to the, the 9th and 10th centuries as the crucible of, of Europe, in the sense that it was in this period of war and, uh, and invasion and, and these attacks that uh, really Europe took the, the shape that it takes today in, in, in many ways. Uh, you can kind of see the rough outlines of what would become England, uh, Germany, and France, three of the main dominant European powers. These three future nations, they weren't nations at this point, but these three future nations really began to take shape uh, in the, especially the 10th century, during the, the last days of the early medieval period. Now, the <coughs> The, the stability that came to Europe as a result of these reactions uh, prepared the way for what is called the High Middle Ages, the period from about the year 1000 to about 1300. And it's a period when Europe experienced great prosperity. And it's called the High Middle Ages because it was the high point of medieval civilization. Remember, medieval being that, that coming together or synthesis of, of the legacy of classical Greece and Rome Christianity and the church, and also Germanic uh, culture. All right, so that's what we're going to talk today. We're going to talk about these uh, reactions to these invasions first, um, and the formation of the rough outlines of England, France, and Germany. And then we're going to talk about the High Middle Ages and the, the significant developments of that period uh, in world history. All right, now. <clears throat> Like I said, when these invasions occurred, you can see the, rough, the beginning of the rough outlines of England, Germany, and France. So let's look at each one of those. Let's look at England first. Now, the, uh, the main attacks against England were by the Danes the, from Denmark, from Scandinavia. The Danes, uh, they began their, their attacks on the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms really about the end of the eighth century. And the Danes were coming not just to plunder and toil and Kill, but they also were settling. You know, they, when they came to England, they were uh, settling in the in the area. Now, um, as a result of these Danish attacks, pretty much almost all all of the West, all of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms that had been created were destroyed. The Danes occupied most of England, and uh, by the time you get to about the end of the ninth of the ninth century, only one Saxon kingdom was left, the kingdom of Wessex. Uh, Wessex, meaning the kingdom of the West Saxons. And uh, now the king of, the we of Wessex was Alfred, known to history as Alfred the Great, because he was the first king of England. Now he, uh, he was in a bit of a pickle when he came to the throne. The Danes were on the move, and he, he was the, his kingdom was the last surviving Saxon kingdom. But he rallied his people, and uh, he, uh, one of the things he he realized was that uh, in order to defeat the, the Vikings, you had to have a navy, because the Vikings were, were great sailors and, and had a great ship, of great sh ships. Uh, so he created a navy, and uh, he created a navy and, and defeated the Danes uh, in their own element, defeated them at sea. And, and remember, England would go on 
to have a great fleet and a great naval history. And so uh, that's one reason why Englishmen look at Alfred as a great king, because he's sometimes called the founder of the English Navy, even though he really wasn't. But he did build a navy, defeat the Danes, and won a great victory over the Danes at the Battle of Eddington in 877 AD. Um, another thing he did was that uh, when, he, when he conquered the Danes, when he defeated the Danes, he would uh, set up um, fortresses uh, occupied by militiamen. Uh, you know, and these, uh, these, uh, these forts were called burrows, which is an old Germanic word for fort, burrow. And uh, a lot of these burrows that he, he established um, became, <laughs> later became towns, and that's why the term, the term borough, you see a lot of boroughs in America, Jonesboro, for example. But boroughs is an old English word for, for fort. And he established these forts that would later become prominent English towns, bur the various boroughs. Um, but the, he eventually defeated all the Danes and, uh, and, and united all of England under his reign. So for the first time, all of England was ruled by a single king. Uh, that's why he's called the first king of a united England. And uh, one of the things he did was that he um, compelled the Danes to convert to Christianity. Part of the price of, of, of making peace and, and ending the war was that the Danes agreed to, um, to be baptized. So the Danes were baptized. Um, Alfred himself was a big promoter of the church and a big supporter of the church throughout his reign. Um, he actually, uh, he had actually, before he, he had become king, he had planned on a career in the church as a, as a priest. He had actually had planned to be a priest, but his older brother had died, and so he had to assume the throne. So, but he was a big patron of the church and translated uh, Bede's history of, uh, of, of England into, uh, into English, into, in, in, in their own English tongues from Latin. He was, he was well, he could speak and read and understand Latin, which was very rare for a king to be, to be illiterate. It was very rare in this day and age, and he was a literate man, could read Latin and translate it. Now, now uh, Alfred established a, a dynasty, the House of Wessex, that would rule England for the next <coughs> several centuries. And this was a very successful kingdom. And uh, one of the reasons why it was so successful was that they established the rule of law throughout all of England. Um, one of the, uh, now this, this was the work of, the, of, of not just Alfred, but all of the successors. One of the things they did, they were good organizers. You know, they, they, they divided England into um, shires. A shire was a, was a province. And uh, under every shire, they appointed a reeve, uh, a reeve being a supervisor, a, a governor, uh, a, a man of the law, to oversee the law of the land. And uh, that's where we get the word sheriff. It means come to, eventually it was the reeve of the shire, or the shire reeve, and then eventually it would become the word sheriff. So every shire had a sheriff. And the job of the sheriff was to go and uh, oversee the courts. Now, uh, the, the Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons, were divided up, were, were organized into hundreds. Uh, that would be a hundred heads of households, a hundred um, hundred families, and uh, they, they were they were called hundreds courts. And uh, all these all the people who lived in that area, who were part of these hundred families, they would come together regularly, and uh, they would. Uh, hear the law. And, you know, if there was any, if there was any kind of complaint between any member. If there was a dispute, or if somebody accused somebody else of stealing, then uh, the job of the sheriff, the shire reeve, was to go and oversee the courts and uh, to make sure that justice was done. And uh, now this was a big, this was a big uh, step because traditionally the Anglo-Saxons often took law into their own hands. You know, often if there was a dispute between families, they just settled it through bloodshed. Or they, there was called the Vergeld, where you would, uh, if somebody killed a member of your family, you would, uh, you would demand that the family of the, of the person who committed the crime pay you a, a, a Vergeld, a man price, to make up for that loss. And so traditionally, in, in Anglo-Saxon Germanic culture, 
uh, disputes were settled by feuds and violence, by family feuds. But this was a big step forward in the sense that it was the sheriff, the appointee of the king now, who was overseeing these courts and making sure that justice was done. And if somebody did commit a crime, then, and they had to pay a fine, the fine was paid to the state, was paid. And, and this was a big source of revenue for the kings of England because now these sheriffs would be in charge of collecting all the penalties and all the fines and bringing them back to the king and they would enter into the king's treasury. So not only were the sheriffs establishing the law, the royal law throughout the land, but also they were um, uh, bringing revenue to the king of England, to the central government. Um, another thing about the, the House of Wessex was they believed in the written law. It probably had something to do with the fact that uh, Alfred, the founder, was a, a man of letters and uh, <coughs> influenced by the written law, the scriptures. You know, he was a man of the cloth originally. And so there was a strong belief that, that you would need to have the written laws, and uh, these laws needed to be followed through. And they were called writs. Think of the word written. But writs were the, the laws of the land. The king, the king would meet with his uh, great nobles, uh, the earls, they were called the earls. And uh, the earls and the king, they, they had a big assembly. It was called the witan. And they would meet, and they, they would, the, the job of the Witan would be to, uh, to work with the king to issue the laws of the land, that all people in the land would have to follow these written laws. Now, um, when, they, when they had these law courts, when you had these law courts, um, the, law, the, the, the rules that governed these law courts, oversaw by the sheriffs, uh, were based on custom and tradition. There was, there was a living law that went back to the Germanic roots of the Anglos and Saxons. These were the ways that laws were done. And uh, it, was, it became known as the common law. This was just the law of the land based on tradition. Now the thing about traditions is that traditions are very flexible. They, they change over time based on as circumstances change, traditions change. And so the common law was kind of like a living organism that, that was subject to change and and influenced by outside forces over time. Now, and that's why the common law would be influenced by Roman law and by church law and would uh, evolve over time into what we consider the common law today. You know, common law is the law of the land in uh, 49 out of 50 states. Anybody know the one state where you don't have common law is the law of the land? Anybody know? Louisiana. But <laughs> Napoleonic law is the law of the land in, in, in Louisiana, but uh, common law uh, goes back, the law of the land in Tennessee goes back. Now the common law, like I said, was a living organism that changed over time. Uh, when, when, the, when the sheriff back in England in the 10th century was uh, overseeing the law, they had little different procedures than they have today. For example, you had trial by combat. Like if one guy accused the other guy of a crime, they'd say, okay, you guys fight it out, and the winner's innocent, and the guy who loses is guilty. <laughs> That's it. That was the tradition, right? That was the common law of the 10th century. Or they had a thing called compurgation. If one guy could get 10 guys to swear that he was innocent, but the other guy could only get nine, the guy who had 10 guys to swear he was innocent was the winner. Um, they also had trial by ordeal, like you had to, they would, they, would, they would put a cross in boiling water and you'd have to reach in and pull the cross out from the boiling water. If your hand healed, well you're innocent. You, if it got all gross and, and infected, obviously you, you were guilty. So, so th these, are, these are ancient traditions that probably go back to the pagan days of the Germanic peoples. But those are the common law. Now over time these laws change and these procedures change because common law, like I said, was something that could change over time uh, under, different, under different circumstances. So one of the results of the invasions of the Danes in England was the creation of a strong state with a rule of law and, and the development, the, the first development of common law. <clears throat> All right. Now, uh, let's talk about Germany. Now, now Germany, in Germany, uh, the main attackers were the Vikings from the north, the Danes especially, and also the Magyars from the east. And uh, what happened is that uh, in Germany, they did something that, well, was Germanic tradition, of course. Um, 
the great, the great dukes of the kingdom. Uh, as, the, as a result, what came out of the Carolingian, the, the, the fall of the Carolingian Empire was that uh, the uh, one of the results of that fall was that uh, you had these great dukes in Germany, uh, these these kings, these rulers. They weren't kings; they were dukes. And uh, these dukes, uh, when they were confronted with the Vikings from the north and from the the Magyars from the east. Um, they did what all Germanic peoples did. They found the greatest leader among them, the, 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 the chieftain who they thought could lead them to victory, and they recognized them as their leader. Remember, that was that, the common conscious. Now, the, uh, the dukes of Germany felt that the, the duke of Saxony, uh, Otto, in the, about, about 936, they felt that he was the man who had the resources and the leadership skills to lead German forces to victory against their enemies. So he was recognized in 936 as the king of the Germans. And uh, he was very successful. He led. Now, one reason why he was successful was that northern Germany, which included the Duke Duchy of Saxony, included those Saxons who had only converted to Christianity due to the results of Charlemagne. And they were, it was, they were very, it was a very strong kingdom. And uh, they could bring in a lot of soldiers to fight in their armies. And uh, the Saxons led the Germans to victory at the Battle of Lechfield, 955. The Magyars were decisively defeated. And the Magyars retreated back to the Hungarian plain. And eventually they would convert to Christianity and their, their uh, depredations would cease. But, uh, but this victory at Lechfeld saved Germany from future attacks by the Magyars. Now, um, one of the things that Otto did, though, was that he decided to... Uh, intervene in Italy. He marched his armies into Italy, and uh, he, uh, there, there was a dispute in Rome about who should be the Pope. He intervened and uh, uh, put up a candidate as the new Pope in Rome, and he was crowned by the Pope as the Roman, quote-unquote, emperor. And uh, about following the the precedent that had been established by Charlemagne in 800. So, so Otto became known as Otto the Great and kind of founded a quote-unquote Roman Empire that was kind of a smaller version of Charlemagne's empire. So this, this new Roman quote-unquote empire included just basically what is today Germany and uh, Italy. Um, and this, uh, this later became known as the Holy Roman Empire. This Holy Roman Empire would exist uh, all the way up until it was dissolved by Napoleon in 1806. So it lasted almost a thousand years. Um, but this Roman Empire goes back to Otto the Great's crowning by the Pope in uh, 962 uh, AD. Now, France, by far, suffered the most depredation because they were attacked on all three sides. Vikings from the north, Saracens from the south. Some Hungarians made it all the way and attacked southern France. So the Magars, I mean the, the French were really a mess. Now the, uh, the problem that France had was that they had no strong leaders. The last Carolingians um, were not too effective. Um, this, you can tell by the names. You know, you, you know when you talk about the. Remember, we talked about how the Franks were very frank, and uh, the kings, the later kings of France, who were Carolingians, had names like Charles the Fat. Doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, does it? My favorite one, Charles the Simple. They have any names? They weren't. They weren't like the Hammer or the Great. They were like the Fat and the Simple. So they weren't exactly effective kings and. Basically, what happened was that uh, France just fell apart completely. There, there was a complete collapse of any kind of central government. But the French, the French, though, they adapted. And, and in, in, in this time when they were just completely under attack and there was raids and killings and ravaging going all over France, they, they created a system to establish order. <laughs> wow, that was either a ghost thing. Uh, they established a system to establish order and with the lack of a central government. 
system that the French created is called feudalism. And this system was created in France, especially southern France and central France, and it would be a system that would spread across Europe over time. But it was kind of created in the chaos of the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries in France. Now, what it is is that uh, feudalism was a way of creating a, a, a military defense in the absence of the central government. And, the, and, the, and it's uh, the, the two things you need are a lord and a vassal. What happened during this time is that a landowner would approach a warrior and he would say, if you'll be my vassal, I'll be your lord and we'll work together. And the way it would work is that the lord would grant land to the vassal and, the, and the, on, the, on the condition that the vassal agree to be loyal and to fight for the lord. So if you were a landowner who had lots of land, and you would give out land to, to a vassal, and, and, that, and you, that land would be owned by that vassal on the condition that that vassal would fight. You see, these landowners realized they needed knights, they needed, they needed uh, warriors on horseback, they needed uh, these warriors to fight for them, and they would agree, they would agree to give them land, and land that they could pass on to their heirs as long as they agreed to continually fight and be a, a, a knight fighting to defend the Lord. And uh, whenever this happened, the Lord and vassal would take an oath. And, it, it, and the, 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 the uh, and the, 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 it's in Latin it's called a foidum. That's how we get the word feudalism. The oath was an oath of loyalty that the Lord took to the vassal and the vassal took to the Lord. And the, the grant of land that was made to the vassal that was that they were sworn to was called a thief. Also comes from Foyt. So a fiefdom. So so now this this uh, the, the Lord and the vassal, the relationship between the Lord and the vassal, and the oaths of loyalty that they took to one another were at the the base were the basis of the system of feudalism. So what would happen over time was that the most powerful landlords would create armies of knights, of vassals who would fight for them and defend them from attacks. And sometimes, uh, some, some vassals would be, have enough land that some vassals would have vassals of their own. See what I'm saying? It's called sub -infudation. So you, you have a system where some, you, you have a landlord who have many vassals, and maybe some of those vassals would have vassals of their own. So it was, it, and uh, at, the, at, the, at the lowest level would be the vassals or the knights who would, who would have land but would have no vassals of their own. They would be at the bottom of the system of feudalism. But feudalism only involved the aristocracy. So they only, it only involved the elite. Because um, when land grants were made <coughs> from a lord to a vassal, it was understood that the vassal's job was to be a warrior. And so when these land grants were made, um, the land grant came with the labor force, and uh, so so when the when the a, a vassal received a fief, it came not only with land but with the labor that was with the land, and the the peasants, the the agricultural laborers who worked the land were called serfs, and the estate that they worked on was called the manor. So sometimes you hear the phrase manorialism, and uh, manorialism was the system where the serfs, the agricultural laborers, worked for the landlord. Feudalism is a different system. That's the system of loyalties between the lords and the vassals. It only involved the elites, the aristocracy. So feudalism involved the nobility, but manorialism involved the elite aristocrat who owned the land and the commoners, the peasants, who worked the land for that landlord, for that uh, aristocrat. <coughs> Now, so the reason why you, you had this system in place was that these peasants had to work day in and day out so that the, land, the aristocrat could collect 
the food and the and all that. <clears throat> and that way he could devote all of his time to doing his main job, which was to be a warrior, to have trained to be a knight, to be a trained knight. Now also, as part of this system, the the, the Lord who was the Lord of the manor, he was expected to maintain law and order in his manor. So all the all the peasants who lived in the manor, they looked to the local aristocrat, the, the landlord, to ensure peace and law and protection. That's why every manor usually had a castle. The purpose of the castle was to provide defense, not just for the aristocrat, but for all the peasants. So if there was an attack, the peasants would go to the castle and uh, find refuge there. Because the job of the that one of the things that the peasants expected from this relationship was that they expected defense. They expected the lord of the manor to provide them with defense from attacks and provide justice. So if, if, if in a village in the manor, if there was ever any kind of dispute or problem, they looked to the landlord to settle that dispute. So every, every manor would have a court of justice. So, so feudalism and manorialism together provided peace and order and security and government in, in, in all in what we consider government, but at a local, completely local level. There wasn't any strong central government whatsoever. It was, everything was at the local level. Now, um, just give me an example of feudalism in action. Um, uh, the King Charles the Simple, uh, who was the Carolingian king, he was uh, totally incapable of doing anything. And uh, the, the Vikings were on the attack. And so what, the, uh, what Charles the Simple did was he recognized one of these Vikings. His name was Rollo. Rollo the Dangler, that was his nickname. Rollo was uh, asked to become a duke. He was, he was recognized as the Duke of Normandy. He was, he was, a, he was a, basically a Viking warlord who had a bunch of Normans or Norsemen under his command. And he was given land in the north of France with the understanding that he would defend that land from other Vikings. So he became the Duke of Normandy. And, he, and when he did this, he agreed to convert to Christianity. And uh, so he converted to Christianity and became no longer Rollo the Dangler, but Robert, the first Duke of Normandy. And uh, he is the direct ancestor, of course, of uh, the, the current kingdom rulers of England. Let, let you know. So uh, King Charles, or Prince Charles, and, his, and Prince William, you know, of William and Kate, they are direct descendants of uh, Rollo the Dangler, or uh, Robert of Normandy, as he became known. But anyway, um, but that happened in 911. So, so basically, in that year, the Duke of Normandy was the vassal of the King of France, at least in name. All right. Now, <clears throat> the, like I said, the Carolingian kings. Uh, the later Carolingian kings of France were very weak and uh, incapable of keeping the peace. And that's why you had the system of feudalism develop. Now, in 887, one of the, the French d dukes, he was actually a count, the Count of Paris, his name was Odo, he successfully defended Paris from the Vikings. And the great nobles of France said, that's what we need. We, you know, in the Germanic tradition, we need a ruler who's going to lead us to victory. So. The, the dukes and the counts of the great nobles of France, they chose Odo as the new king of, of, of France, the new king of the West Franks or the king of Franks to replace the Carolingians. Now, in the years that followed, though, um, the, the great kings of, uh, the great nobles of France, France they, 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 had this, they kept on electing kings, electing a king, one of their own, and either they chose a Carolingian or they chose somebody of the House of Odo from the, from the Counts of Paris. Now, uh, eventually, one of the Counts of Paris, Hugh Capet, he would be a, I think he would be the great nephew of Odo. He was the Count of Paris, and he was chosen king in 987. He was chosen king of France, uh, being the most powerful of all the nobles of France. Now, he did something smart, though. He realized that if he, that when he died, the great nobles of France would just choose maybe a Carolingian or some other ruler to be king of France. So what he decided to do is as soon as he was recognized as king of France, 
he had his son, his name was Robert, he had his son crowned the crowned prince. But later on, the crowned prince was known as the Dauphin. So he basically, he wanted to make sure that his family would rule as a dynasty of kings of France. So he, he started a tradition where the king of France would crown his eldest son um, as the uh, king and, and successor. And, uh, and so, and, the, and the, the, as a result, Hugh Capet was the founder of a dynasty. For, for the next 300 or plus years, there would always be an eldest son to succeed the Capetian king. And you have a Capetian dynasty that would rule France for the next 300 plus years, all the way up until the, the 14th century. You would have a Capetian dynasty. Now, the Capetian dynasty, when it first started, beginning with Hugh Capet, he gave his name to the dynasty, by the way, um, their, their direct rule only was the area around Paris. I mean, they ruled directly the area around Paris. All the rest was ruled by the great, the great princes of France, the dukes and the counts. So their, their actual rule was limited. They were, the, they were the head of the whole system of feudalism. So they were the, the chief lord would be the king, and his direct vassals would be the great princes, the dukes and the counts. And of course, they would have all vassals of their own. But at the height of the pyramid would have been the king of France. But his real, his real power was just the area around Paris. The great princes of France, France, the dukes and the counts, they were pretty much independent of the central government, uh, and, but recognized in, in theory that the king of France was their, their lord. Um, now, one of the things that came out of feudalism was this, you know, it says that Hugh Capet crowned his son as his heir. And one of the things that came about because of feudalism was this idea of what's called primogeniture, the idea that the eldest son gets everything. Remember, it, it was Germanic tradition, it was Germanic tradition that the whole, all the lands be divided up equally among all the sons. But feudalism changed that because in feudalism, remember, all land ownership was conditional. Remember, land ownership meant that you were expected to provide a warrior to defend that land. That was the whole, the whole purpose of feudalism, right? So basically, the land didn't belong to the vassal to divide up among his kids. That land had to stay together as a unit because that was part of the fief. That was part of the agreement. So it be, because of feudalism, it became the tradition that um, when, a, when a great noble died, he would recognize his eldest son to be his heir and to rule all the land, to, to, be, to, to uh, inherit everything. That meant that the second and third sons got zilch. And uh, this created a problem because these second and third sons often were trained as knights. Or they went into careers into the church. And uh, if they were trained as knights, that meant that they didn't want to, they wanted to be something. And that's, that was the reason why, one of the reasons why feudalism as a system would be, would be exported to other countries. Because you always have these second and third sons who got nothing but wanted something. And they were, always, they were very active and they, were, they wanted something. And that is, well, that's one of the reasons why feudalism, as we see, would be a system that would, would, would expand to other areas. Because you have these second and third sons who wanted to become princes themselves, who wanted to own land, wanted to have something. They, they, and they would be very adventurous. It also helps to explain the Crusades, as we'll see later. All right. So, uh, so that's uh, that's uh, France, England, and Spain. You see the I'm not Spain, France, England, and Germany. We can start to see their outlines formed in this period of invasion and war of the of the ninth and tenth centuries. All right. Now the. Uh, The, the period of the 9th and 10th centuries, it set the stage for what is called the High Middle Ages. It uh, established order and peace. And uh, so the, the early Middle Ages really ends around 1000, 1050 AD. And uh, the next 300 years or so is known as the High Middle Ages. Now, <clears throat> uh, a couple things about the High Middle Ages. What is it known for? Well. One thing, one thing it's known for is that it marks 
the real high point of the influence of the church, especially the papacy. Uh, the papacy would become the most powerful institution in Europe during the High Middle Ages. And the Pope was more, probably more powerful and more influential than any ruler during the High Middle Ages. And uh, you know, the, the Middle Ages is sometimes called the Age of Faith. Well, the, in, the, in the High Middle Ages, the church uh, was the most powerful institution shaping society. So one of the most important aspects of the High Middle Ages is the power, power and influence of the Pope and the power and influence of the church in general in shaping society and culture uh, throughout Europe. Uh, another, another development we see is that we see uh, economic growth. We see uh, population growth and the growth of cities and the growth of trade in this period. And uh, of course, the rise of a new class of people, uh, a middle class. You know, uh, one of the things that came out of feudalism was that either you had landowning aristocrats who were warriors or you had peasant laborers. Well, as a result of economic trade and economic expansion during the High Middle Ages, there emerged a third class, a class that was not as poor as agricultural laborers as peasants, but not as wealthy or powerful as landowning aristocrats, somewhere in between. It was in the middle. And this middle class were, was associated especially with uh, craftsmen and traders and merchants living in the rising towns. Uh, and uh, they were so, this middle class was so associated with trade and industry that uh, they were called city folk, townspeople, uh, bourgeoisie or bourgeois, which is the French word for uh, towns dweller. And so the, the rising towns and the economic prosperity that came out of the high middle ages would result in the growth of this middle class, this bourgeoisie uh, in, the, in this period. Another development we see in this period is that there emerged strong states. They were, they were called feudal states. Feudalism provided the building blocks for the creation of strong, eventually the creation of strong centralized states. Uh, not so much in Germany, but in England and France and, as we'll see, Spain. So, uh, and eventually these feudal kingdoms that developed in Spain, in France, in England, would become the basis for the emergence of modern nation states uh, after 1500. So the, the uh, modern nation states of Europe have their origins, have their beginnings in the feudal kingdoms that were established during the, uh, during the High Middle Ages, especially the feudal kingdoms of England and France and Spain. All right, so those are the major things we're going to be looking at. All right, so let's begin by talking about economic growth. Um, this period really, the population really, really took off in the period, this period. And uh, it had a lot to do with global warming. You know, whenever you hear global warming or climate change today, there's always, you always sense like there's this music in the back. Like, bum, bum, bum. You know, like, Oh, we're all gonna die! You know, it's a, oh, we gotta do something about global warming, climate change. Ah, you know. But <clears throat> climate change not always a bad thing. Uh, we know that, in fact, uh, the climate of Europe in the year 1250, 1200, was probably a lot warmer than it is even today. In fact, I read somewhere there was there was more carbon dioxide, you know, global warming gas. There was more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in, in the year 1200 in Europe than there is today. So anyway, so there was, uh, it was a time of great global warming. And uh, <clears throat> this was actually a good thing though, because it meant that winters were short and you had a longer growing season, which meant that you had lots of food and good harvests. And that meant lots of food meant population growth. You gotta remember that in, this, in the pre-industrial age, one of the biggest killers of people was malnutrition because people who are malnourished, uh, especially children who are malnourished, they are more susceptible to epidemic diseases, whether it be cholera or smallpox or whatever. So if you have a population that's well fed though, especially children that are well fed, then they are going to be able to survive even if there is epidemic disease. And then they grow up, they reach adulthood, they get married, they have children. So um, 
So the result is that when you have a period where you have lots of food or a, a relative abundance of food, you're going to have lots of children surviving infancy, surviving childhood, and growing up and having children of their own. You've got to remember that most women, it wasn't uncommon for a woman in this day and age to be pregnant 10 to 15 times in their, I mean, women, you know, women would get married and, and they would have lots of children. Uh, most women would die sometime of, of the result of having so many children. Uh, and, and they might give birth 10 times and only have like two or three children reach the age of 10. I mean, that's, that, that's just the way it was. I mean, women would have lots of children, but only a handful of them would make it. Most of them would die of some disease or die in, as a baby. So and it, was, it was a tough world, it was a tough life. But with lots of food, you could have more uh, children surviving and then having children of their own. So whenever you had plentiful harvests, you would have lots of population growth. And the population of Europe just took off in this period, just took off. What um, do you think the uh, reasoning why it would have had a higher carbon dioxide level? I don't know. I'm not a climate, not a climate person. I don't know. That's, that's just the way it, it was. You know, Greenland back then, you know, the Vikings, you know, the Vikings were great sailors, and they developed the Viking longboat, which was a great ship. And Vikings actually uh, sailed to Iceland. They settled Iceland. Well, they still believe in elves, by the way. I, I heard that in a report. Uh, they settled in Iceland, and they also settled Greenland. Greenland was, could support an agricultural population in the 1100s. Uh, and, that's, and then it was from Greenland that they established for a brief time a, a colony in Newfoundland in Canada. Um, but but uh, yeah, it was a lot warmer back then for some reason. I mean, it wasn't, when they first came to Iceland, it wasn't just a, a rock of ice. I mean, they, they was, had, you could support a population there. Uh, and there's, there's evidence to show that from about the uh, 7th century, 8th century, all the way up until about 1200, um, it was a period of constant cli of, um, global climate change warming. You know, the, the glaciers on the Alps were, were, were shrinking in this period up until 1200. So it was a period of global warming, and it was a positive thing for Europe's population. Another thing that was going on was Dun, 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 deforestation. You know, nowadays we hear about deforestation. Oh my gosh, they're killing the trees. This is horrible. Not the trees. Don't kill the trees, man. But, you know, when in, in, the, in the high middle ages, they were going nuts with axes. They were cutting down trees left and right. I mean, there was a time when, when Europe was just one big forest. But these, in the high middle ages, they were, they were cutting down trees and they were turning them into farmland every day. That, more, that meant more food. That meant more population growth. So they were, they were cutting down trees and they were raising crops in forests. Um, there's a great story that uh, remember I talked about how Boniface was the patron saint of Germany. The, the great, uh, um, the great uh, uh, apolo uh, 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 apostle to the Germans. And uh, he, he, uh, his, his way of uh, of uh, preaching would be with an axe. He would go into the sacred trees. You know, the, the, the Germans were uh, believed the trees were holy and sacred and inhabited by spirits. And so uh, Boniface would go in there with his axe and say, well, your gods aren't real. There's only one true God, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to go in and cut down all your trees. <laughs> so he would walk around with an axe and cut down trees. And there's, I, I, mean, I tell you that story because one theory is, is that uh, Christ, the growth of Christianity um, took away the gods. And so that meant that a lot of these sacred forests weren't sacred anymore. And these, these forests weren't as scary. I mean, there was a time when the pagan Germans believed that the forests were full of elves and, and dwarves and malel and, and uh, ogres, and that these were, these were gods and it was scary and they were sacred and uh, they, they needed to be honored and with sacrifices, and human, sometimes human sacrifices. You know, in, in desolate forests, they would, they would kill people and offer them to their gods. You know, they find them every once in a while. But with Christianity, all of a sudden, the, the forests were kind of demystified. They were just part of God's creation. And human beings, as stewards of God's creation, could do whatever they wanted with them. And they went in there with axes, and they cut down those trees, and they turned them into farmland in the, in the high Middle Ages. So uh, some people have said that that was a, the conversion of Christianity had that kind of impact, where they... 
They weren't afraid to go cut down some forests and turn them into farmland to support a rising population. Another thing was going on was dun 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 destruction of the wetlands. Oh my gosh, not the wetlands. Don't kill the wetlands, man! But you gotta remember that uh, what is today Belgium and the Netherlands, you know, uh, the, that much of, of northern Europe was just underwater. It was under sea level. It's very flat. In northern Germany and northern uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, it's, uh, it's, it's very, it's called the flatland, the lowland, the low country for a reason, because it's very flat and much of it's below sea level. But during this period, do a lot of hard work, a lot of these lands were, were transferred into farmland. They cleared the swamps. They, they built dikes, and they built canals, and they built uh, dams, and they, they worked for a lot of years. And uh, the low countries, over time, were converted into farmland. In fact, uh, the Flemings, who, who lived in this area, in the low country, uh, gained a reputation as being hard-working people, because, I mean, they turned wetlands and swamp into very flourishing farmland. And so Flemings were actually imported uh, all over Europe because uh, there was a desire for Flemings because these, these people had this reputation for being such hard workers. And so they, a lot of Flemings went to Ireland, they went to Scotland, they went to England. You know, how, how many people know that? I mean, somebody who descended from people who were called were Flemings. They even went to Poland. They went to northern Germany. They were, they were recruited as workers all over Europe because of their great skill in building dikes and being hard, having a reputation for being hard workers. And so, uh, so that was, uh, so, so a lot of these uh, lands, uh, forests were being transformed into farmland, wetlands were being transformed into, into farmland, rising populations were being supported by a rising productive farmland throughout Europe in this time period. Now, another reason for economic growth in this period was because of all kinds of new technology. Now, I'm not talking about computers or fancy schmancy people in lab coats. I'm talking about just basic, good, practical inventions that were all invented or at least adopted, brought to Europe during this time period, um, and new ways of growing crops. Like, during the High Middle Ages, well, it actually began in the, late, in the early Middle Ages, but during the Middle Ages, farmers realized that you needed to have crop rotation, where you, you, you needed, basically, you couldn't plant the same crops year after year. You had to give the land a rest. You had to find ways to revitalize the soil. And so they developed, a, throughout Europe, they developed the, three, the crop rotation, the three field system, where you, all your land would be divided up into three parts. And right? one would be fallow, you wouldn't grow any crops on. One would be where you'd be growing clover and, and then plowing the clover into the, into the soil to, to restore nutrients to the soil. And then one third of the land would actually grow your wheat. And, so it was, and, then, and then you'd rotate your land every year. So that the idea would be that you'd be, um, they also realized the importance of fertilizer. That uh, you know, on the fallow land, that's where they allow their animals to do their business because they realized that, uh, and, and they also began to collect uh, manure. They realized that, hey, let's go out. They actually had guys who go out there and collect the animal's refuse and put it in a big, in a big pile, and then they could use it to, to fertilize their field. There, I mean, this was a big deal, because back in the, in the Iron Age, back in earlier fields, times, the Germans, whenever the land would go, they would just <coughs> start a new settlement. They'd just move, <laughs> you know? Oh, well, the soil's not productive anymore. This just go somewhere else. But they didn't do that anymore. They realized you could, you could restore the nutrients to the soil. You could, you could live on the same piece of land for, for a long generation after generation as long as you treated it right through crop rotation. Also, uh, a couple things that happened. Also, the, the use of the heavy plow. Uh, the heavy plow was a, was a plow. Uh, it was actually invented by the Romans back in the first century AD. But, but it, was, uh, it became widely adopted in the high middle ages uh, and uh, the heavy plow, you needed, a, you needed to have a strong draft animal to pull it. But you could, you, it made it possible to transform the heavy, wet soil of northern Europe and to grow crops there. This was land that with a, with a, a weaker plow would never be able to be used. But with a heavy plow, you could, you could plow this land. Um, now, one of the things they developed, though, remember you need a good, strong draft animal to, to, to pull a plow. 
to pull these heavy plows. And during the High Middle Ages, what happened was that the, uh, they, they were able to use horses as draft animals. And this was a result of the development of the horse collar and horseshoes. You see, uh, uh, in ancient times, uh, the only animals that pulled plows were oxen. And oxen are stupid. And oxen are slow. And, uh, and horses were only used in battle and for racing. You couldn't use a horse for heavy labor. You couldn't use a horse to pull a wagon because the collar that they used would strangle the horse. All the weight was put on the horses. They had to pull anything heavy. And also, horses have their legs aren't as sturdy as an ox. So if a horse is forced to carry a heavy burden, they'll, they'll break a foot. So what happened, though, was in the High Middle Ages, first they developed a horse collar that, that put the burden on the, sh on the horse's shoulders so it wouldn't suffocate, right? And then they also developed horseshoes. Horseshoes were developed to give a horse, to reinforce a horse's hoof so they couldn't carry heavy burden. Now, probably the original purpose of horseshoes was with all the armor that, that knights were carrying, they needed something to reinforce the horse so the horse could carry a heavily armed knight. But eventually somebody came to the idea, hey, you know what, if horses have horseshoes, then they can also carry heavy burdens and pull a plow. So during the high middle ages, for the first time, horses were being used to pull wagons and to pull plows. And that's why every village needed a smith. Who introduced the horse into the English culture, just out of curiosity? Well, they've been around since, you know, the days of the Celts, you know, the Celts in the before Christ, you know. came up from the steps, didn't they? The horses were probably brought in the, uh, the, the idea was, one of the main ideas that were introduced about 2000 BC uh, by immigrants coming from the steppe. And uh, so, so since the Bronze Age, they've had, you know, they've had horses in, in Western Europe. Now, um, so, so the horses were being used for their labor. And the horses are smarter than oxen, and they're faster. So it did a great use of horses as draft animals and the use of horses in the fields did a lot to promote efficiency. And, uh, and that was a big factor. Increased, in uh, increased efficiency means increased production. That means more food, more food, and, and that supports rising population. A couple other things that came about that weren't as important, but were still important. The wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow was invented in China. But by the time you get to about the 12th century, it was introduced to Europe. Efficiency, you know, it's a lot easier. I mean, imagine if you could carry things on your back. That was a huge wheelbarrow, saved a lot of time, a lot of time for people. Made things a lot more, in, more productive. Another big thing was the windmill. The wind, you harnessing wind power. You know, for thousands of years, you know how, how wheat was turned into flour? Yeah, you, you had women sitting around doing this. Hey, how's it going? What's going on, man? You know, I mean, I mean, they spent hours grinding grain into flour, just using rock. You'd have a big old rock, and you grind it with a big old pestle. So someone came around with a windmill. The windmill was invented in China, got to Europe by about 1,300 or 1,200 or so. And the wind, you could also use a water mill, too. A water mill, using rock water, or you could use wind. To, and it, and it, then the, the water or the wind moves the... The, the big rock against the little rock, and you crush the grain into flour. That's why, by the time you get to the end of the Middle Ages, every village had a miller and a smith. <laughs> That's why there's so many millers and smiths in the world. Because every village, you needed somebody to be in charge of the mill. And everybody would bring their, their grain to the miller, and he would mill it, and he owned or operated the, the miller. The mill. And every village would have a smith because everybody needed that guy to make their horseshoes, you know. And that's why most people take their names, people take their names from their occupation. And that's why you have so many smiths and millers. Uh, they were in every village. Everybody had to have one. Uh, in England, anyway. Um, and there's Müllers and, and uh, uh, Schmitz in Germany. <laughs> All right. Um, and then another thing that we don't think, we think of the Middle Ages as being dirty and disease and all like that, but they invented soap. Why soap was invented in the Middle Ages? Soap was a big thing for population control. Why would soap, soap, why would soap lead to population growth? Think about 
<laughs> Why would so? Well, okay, you don't they think it's the end of the beer? Oh yeah, sugar. exactly. But what also? What what causes people to die? What infections? What's one way of stopping an infection? Being clean, right? So you know, and, and also cleaning your clothes. And you're the you have a dirty mind. No, I'm just thinking. You know, you walk up honestly. You stop and think about it. They had to have their nose hairs burned out back then because they didn't bathe the way. Well, you know how you get used to Eastman. They yeah. must have just got used to that smell. But just think, yeah. why did yeah. anybody want to get used, used to that smell? To that smell. Yeah. Yeah. But but they invented they spent soap for washing their clothes and washing themselves. Yeah. And so yeah. 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 They invented soap, and that was a big deal because you clean things means it helps yeah. stop diseases. So, so all these inventions also were very important for um, for this for helping population grow. All right, well we've gone for quite a while. Let me take a little break here, and what we're going to do is uh, I'll you know finish doing your uh, your your, your self evaluation and uh, and take a break, but also. Um, Let's, oh, oh, this is what we'll do. What we're going to do is use it as a review. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, uh, in, in, your, in your groups, think about how did England, France, and Spain take shape, compare and contrast, due to the invasions of the Vikings, the Saracens, and the, and the Magi. So think about that. This is just an idea, this, an idea of, uh, an opportunity for all to get together and kind of review your notes and to review the material that we just discussed. So we'll give you about five minutes to do that, and then I'll ask the group to kind of summarize for me. On the finals week, is there that Monday or that Wednesday? Uh, uh, all, right. all right. Now, so, so another reason why you had population growth in this time period was because you had a stable political system. Feudalism provided order uh, in the absence of, of, a, of a strong central government. And uh, feudalism expanded in this time period. It's, it was born and uh, developed in the context of central France, southern France, over the course of the 9th and 10th centuries. But it expanded. One of the reasons why it expanded was because um, you had all these knights who were trained warriors who, if they were the second or third son, they, they weren't going anywhere. And so they, would, uh, they, were, they were recruited uh, all over the place. Uh, for example, uh, when, when William the Conqueror, who we'll get to later, wanted to conquer England to make it his own, he recruited knights from all over France, and they conquered England in 1066. And they, they, they imposed the feudal system that France had on England. Uh, and then from there, it was spread to Ireland and to Scotland. The, the kings of Scotland, who weren't English, who weren't Anglo-Saxon, they were they're part of the Anglo-Saxon, they would actually recruit uh, knights Norman knights uh, to come and fight for them uh, and to be in their armies and uh, and German happened in Germany and in Spain uh, knights from Europe from France were recruited to fight the wars against the the uh, against the uh, Arabs and Moors in Spain uh, and and also so feudalism spread to Spain uh, it was in the 12th century it was in the 11th 12th centuries it spread to Germany. It spread to Hungary. So over the course of a year, feudalism as a political and economic system was adopted uh, over much of Europe. And uh, in every area, it had its own local variation, its own traditions that developed over time. But feudalism was, uh, was a, as a system, provided order and peace over wide swaths of Europe at a time where you, it was impossible to have a real strong centralized government. <laughs> all right, and that, that political order, that peace and security, remember all those peasants who lived, worked on the manor, they knew they were going to be safe because they could go to the castle. So if marauders came or if there was a war, they would find safety. And that kind of peace and security is what you need to really have sustained economic growth, trade, and population growth over time. Now, um, what we see happening is that... Uh, there, there developed, uh, there was a revival of trade, long distance trade in this period, uh, because over time, the, uh, the, the Muslim threat, the Saracen threat in the Mediterranean subsided. Now a lot of it was subsided because of aggressive efforts of Europeans. European, especially the Italians, like in places like Venice and Pisa and Genoa, these were Italian towns. 
These Italians uh, were very aggressive and they built their fleets and they, they took the fight to the, to the Saracens and to the pirates and they began to open up trade routes. Now over time, uh, when, the, when Muslims realized that these people weren't gonna just lay down and die, they were gonna fight back, then that really started trade because when, once people realized that it wasn't gonna be a one-sided, well, you just take what you want, that you, you had to fight, then people say, hey, let's just trade instead of kill each other. So over time, the Italians from Venice and Pisa and Genoa, these Italian traders were op able to open up new trade routes and new trade with Muslim states like in Egypt. Or they reopened trade with the Byzantine Empire, with, with Constantinople. So this, they, they began to see a long distance trade developing. And the Italians, in turn, uh, they brought their wares from the east, uh, precious stones and silks and, and, and spices. They brought these precious exotic goods to the rest of Europe. And so trade really began to, to grow and expand across Europe, well, thanks a lot to these uh, very aggressive Italian traders. Um, now also, what happened is that uh, uh, one reason why the Muslims were, the Saracens were on the defensive was because of aggressive efforts taken by others as well, like the Normans. Remember, the Normans were, uh, were Norsemen, and they were uh, prized as, uh, really as uh, mercenaries because of their strong fighting skills. And the Byzantine Empire in southern Italy began to hire Normans to be their warriors. Now, there are these two brothers named Robert and Roger de Scott. Now, they were, they were Normans, but they had lived in France, Normandy. And these Normans, uh, originally they were hired as mercenaries by the Byzantine Empire. But they kind of went rogue. <laughs> and they, uh, they decided to carve out their own kingdom in southern Italy. And eventually, uh, Roger de Scott, the younger brother, in 1071 AD, he, he conquered Sicily, retook Con Sicily and conquered Sicily from the, uh, from the Saracens. And this, when the Sicily was taken over, Sicily kind of sits right in the middle of the Mediterranean. And its conquest really opened up trade routes and did a lot to open up trade uh, for, for, for Europeans in the Mediterranean, reopened up these old ancient trade routes. Um, another thing that was going on in the Spain, uh, the Reconquista began the reconquest of Spain from the Muslims. And uh, two kingdoms arose especially, the Aragon and Castile. Now, Aragon was founded by, by Charlemagne. It was originally a, a, a duchy established by Charlemagne, but the, the dukes of Aragon were able to, they eventually became independent and assumed the title of king, and they waged war against the Muslims. And uh, count, now Castile, was descended from the old Visigoths, who at one time ruled all of Spain. And uh, these, these in Castile, they also expanded southward. So you had two separate kingdoms, Castile and Aragon. And one reason why they were so successful is that they would, uh, they would put out calls for knights. And so a lot of French knights, second and third generation knights, um, would, uh, would come in and, and fight and uh, wage war and uh, acquire lands for fighting for the kings of Aragon or the kings of Castile. Now, um, Portugal was founded by a French knight. Um, the, a, a French knight uh, carved out his own kingdom, and that would become you know, Portugal uh, in the, uh, the House of Braganza that would rule Portugal, were descended from a French, French knights who came and fought and carved out their own kingdom by waging war against the Muslims and driving them back. So, uh, so it was these aggressive wars fueled by knights in a lot of times who were able to drive back Muslims, open up the Mediterranean, and really revive trade uh, and long distance trade and trade in exotic trade goods uh, in Europe. And uh, this resulted in the growth of towns because uh, if, a, if a village was located along a major trade route, like a, along a major river or a long, uh, near a mountain pass, that, that town would become a center of trade. And um, now, a lot of times, uh, local aristocrats realized that if their town became a center of trade, that that would be a good thing because they could tax it. And so many aristocrats were willing to grant uh, charters to, to, to their local town. Now, when, a, when the town received a charter, 
And, and now it could receive a charter from a duke or from a count or even from a bishop of the local church. When they received a charter, they became a town. And that meant that one of the things of having a, becoming a town and having a charter was that all the people who lived in that town now became free men. They were no longer serfs. They were free men. They were free men. And, uh, and see, that was a good thing. Because that meant that they didn't, have to, they didn't owe any kind of labor services to anybody. Now, they had a tradition across Europe that if you were a serf and you made it to a town, if you lived there a year without getting caught, you automatically became a citizen of that town and a free man. So towns became magnets for hardworking serfs. So, say you're a serf, you're working in a village, you say, I'm tired of being somebody's serf. I want to be independent. So what you do is you'd run away, and you could make it to the town and not get caught and live there for a year. By golly, you were a free man. Now you'd think that aristocrats would be like, hey, that's a terrible tradition. I'm losing all my labor. Now they didn't think that way because they knew that if their town grew, they could tax the town and make more money. So the aristocrats were, were kind of trying to cheat from each other. They were all trying to recruit the best labor force, you know, the best people to come to their town to make their town rich and successful. Now, <clears throat> some towns, if they got big enough, they could buy their freedom so they didn't have to pay any taxes at all. Or they could win their freedom. And when a town won their freedom from their local lord, they became known as a commune. Uh, a commune would be a free town where they didn't have to pay taxes to the local lord. Now, in Spain and in, no, in Spain and England and in France, uh, these towns, when they became communes, they would often recognize only the law of the king. So they would be subject only to the king's authority and nobody else's. Um, now, in, uh, in, in places like Italy and in, northern, and in Germany, especially northern Germany and in the low countries, towns were so big and, that, and there was no local king that they often became independent city-states, independent. And sometimes they even formed leagues of you know, alliances with each other. For example, we'll see in Germany, I mean in Italy, in northern Italy, a group of towns formed the Lombard League. Um, up in northern Germany in the Low Countries, a group of very uh, strong towns formed the Hanseatic League. Uh, so, so some towns, especially in Germany and Italy, got so big and so, so uh, prosperous that they became independent city-states and formed alliances with one another. But most of the towns in England and in France weren't that big. But when they became independent, they became subject to the authority of the king and free from any kind of local landlord, local noble or count or bishop. Now, it was in these towns that we see the rise of the middle class because the people who lived in the towns were free men. They weren't serfs, but they weren't like aristocrats either. They weren't knights. They weren't warriors. They were just, they worked for a living, so they were commoners. They worked with their hands, so they were commoners. But they weren't serfs. So they're somewhere in the middle. That's where we get the phrase middle class. And uh, they're also known as the bourgeoisie because bourgeois is an old word for town. These were townspeople. So the, people, the middle class lived in town. And uh, now what we see happening is that they developed their own kind of system of government. Um, in, uh, in these towns, everybody with all the working people were organized into guilds. Now some were craft guilds where a guild would be where everybody uh, was engaged in the same business, uh, jewelers or shoemakers or weavers. Uh, so you had craft guilds, but you also had merchant guilds. Like a merchant guild would be a, a, everybody in the guild uh, engaged in the same sort of trade. So you could have a guild of, of wool merchants or a guild of salt merchants. Uh, so there would be merchant guilds and there would be craft guilds. And the guilds were the ones that formed the government. So usually every town had a system where the guilds would elect their representatives to sit on the town council, where they became known as the Council of Al Elders, as they're called in England, aldermen. Elders, aldermen, that's what we get the phrase, aldermen. And the, and the, the chief executive would be called the, the first among equals, the mayor, maor. That's, that's Latin. <laughs> that's where we get the word mayor. So, that's, so the guilds formed the government. Now the guilds also performed a system of educational system because everybody in the guild, all the males, 
went through the system of education. You started out as an apprentice, where you learned the trade, then you went, and then once you learned the trade and reached, usually by the time you were a young man, 17, 18, 19, you became a journeyman, and you worked as a, for wages for somebody else. But then, if, if you, once you mastered your skill, you, were, you could join the, the guild as a master craftsman or a master and own your own shop. So, so the guild system not only provided government, but it provided a system of education to train people. And it also provided welfare. Because if, when you were in a member of a guild, if you died and had a widow and small children, the members of the guild were there to, to help you out. So they were kind of like the insurance system of, of, of media of the year. So the guilds were very important in the system. Now sometimes, some guilds, especially the merchant guilds, would be so dominant, they would, they would dominate. Like in Venice, the merchant guilds dominated the city government. And sometimes you develop, within the towns, there developed an aristocracy of sorts of certain merchant guilds that dominated the town. They were often called patricians. So you did, within the ranks of the middle class, you did have, in some cases, some merchant guilds that came to dominate, that formed like an aristocracy within the ranks of the, of the middle class. So that would only be in the largest and wealthiest towns like, like Venice. All right, well, we will, uh, we will finish up the, the Middle Ages if it's not snowing. We'll talk about the Middle Ages and uh, the late Middle Ages in Europe on Wednesday. So I'll see you all on Wednesday, I hope.